Good morning. All right, I'm Catherine Rowe. I'm the president of William and Mary, and I'm so pleased to welcome you here today into what is, to me, an exemplary collaborative space. And I want to talk a little bit about the nature of the collaborative work that I see you doing um, as you convene here. I'm going to start with what we all know, which is that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration predicts that by the end of this century in this region, sea levels could rise by four feet. We are an estuarine campus, and we need to be thinking of ourselves that way, as does the whole region and many of the regions that you come from. The storm surge dilemma is a challenge. We know that this current generation of students and scholars, policymakers, and those who follow will face and one in which William and Mary is uniquely positioned to lead. And you're going to be hearing about that all day, but I want to say how proud and how important I think it is that we are positioned to be able to convene groups like this. Uh, effective and innovative solutions are going to require expertise from multiple domains of knowledge, because this is one of the grand challenges that our world faces in the next century. For the past seven years, the Virginia Coastal Policy Center has been leading efforts to build a coalition, a coalition like the one we're convening today. And I'm so grateful to VCPC Director Elizabeth Andrews, to law school dean Dave Douglas, and to Mike Sapner, one of our trustees on our foundation who is sponsoring today's forum, whom we're going to hear from in just a few minutes. Right now, the Brain Trust gathered in this room includes partners from business, from law, from education, from government, from the public and private sectors, a very rich Brain Trust. So I want to close with a charge to you all, thinking about the rich expertise that you have here, that comes from a notable Virginia coalition builder about a century ago, a woman named Mary Munford who was one of the powerhouses in moving co-education into public higher education in Virginia. She was the first woman on the board of visitors at William and Mary. Like this group, she knew the strength of partnerships to confront large, complex challenges. She was able to advocate for co-education in part because of the network and partnerships across multiple domains and sectors that she was able to build. And contemporaries described her in this way as level-headed and fearless. All right, so think about those two qualities. Level-headed and fear, no, fearless is the way we, as a coalition, as a collaborative group, need to approach the question, the challenge of sea level rise and coastal stability. Uh, that's my charge for you today. Go into the day and carry out from William and Mary those two qualities together. All right? Thank you for that. It's my pleasure now to welcome to the podium Dean Douglas. Well, thank you very much, President Rowe, for those words. And that's, uh, I think we have our good directions as we go forward today. I want to welcome you all here today on behalf of the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. One of the roles that we see is, uh, the, the, the role that we play is as convener, bringing folks together to talk about these important ideas. We've enjoyed doing this for the past several years. This is the, this, the conference today on resilience funding is, is a first for us in terms of this particular topic. I love that we're doing this. This is a very important part of the conversation. And so many of you are here today who can help us think about this over the next several hours. So I'm delighted that you're here. Elizabeth, thank you for the work that the Coastal Policy Center is doing. Thank you for all of you who have come here. I want to particularly thank Mike Sapner uh, and Trans Re for sponsoring the, today's program. And, it, and I look forward to a really wonderful set of conversations and sharing of ideas. Thank you very much for being here. I hope it's a terrific experience for all of you. Thank you. Good morning. So please bear with me as I say thank you to some folks as well, because it, this wouldn't happen today without a number of people and all that they contributed to this effort. So uh, first of all, thank you, President Rowe and Dean Douglas for coming to welcome us this morning. Thank you to you all for coming. I know what a sacrifice that is for some localities to send representatives because you don't have extensive staffs. So that's one of the reasons we're doing this today is to try to share information that you may not have time to go out and research on your own. 
So thank you for taking the time to come today. It's really important. Um, thank you to Mike Sapner and for sponsoring this event and to Transry. We really appreciate it. It wouldn't happen without his vision and his support. And also, I have to thank Admiral Ann Phillips and David Johnson, who served as my informal advisory committee and showed boundless patience and uh, wonderful ideas and inspiration. Thank you all for sharing your expertise. It's wonderful. Um, and I want to thank the Coastal Planning District Commissions, the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission, the Accomack Northampton Planning District Commission, the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, the Northern Neck Planning District Commission in particular, were wonderful partners in trying to provide me with invitation lists to get you all here. So thank you to them. It wouldn't have happened without them as well. And then finally, I need to thank Angela King, my assistant director, for all that she did to make this happen today. And also the students that we have here with us today, Michael, Jess, Carly, Sammy, and Anthony, I would encourage you to go up and talk to them and thank them for their hard work at the registration table and in the parking area. Wouldn't happen without them as well. So the goal of today's program is to bring information here to you. We have experts who've come from out of state to share with us their experiences, uh, their case studies. Localities are in the crosshairs on this. I often say that. You probably heard me say that before. And um, you're the ones on the front lines having to deal with this. So we really appreciate them coming to share what they've learned through their jobs, through their life experiences about flooding, how to deal with it, how to mitigate it, and how to be resilient in the face of it. Um, some innovative funding options will be outlined today and some new ideas on, and new approaches. And I hope that um, you get something out of it. I, I know I have already, just from helping to plan this event. Um, so first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, who many of you know already. She has worked for a number of years to address sea level rise and climate change impacts on national security. And she's now the Special Assistant to the Governor for Coastal Adaptation and Protection and working on developing Virginia's first uh, Coastal Resilience Master Plan. So this is a wonderful event for her to be able to mingle with you all to get your input on what needs to be in that plan and for her to share with us what her intention is with this plan. So we appreciate her being here today. Um, one question we often get is, I'm sure she gets it all the time, how are we going to fund this? How are we going to pay for this? So this is one big step in trying to figure that out. Um, and I also want to introduce Mike Sapner, President and Chief Executive Officer of Transatlantic Holdings Incorporated and Transatlantic Reinsurance Company, Inc., or Transre. Um, I have to note that he did receive his bachelor's degree in economics from the College of William & Mary. I couldn't let that pass. Sorry, Mike. Um, as well as his MBA in finance from New York University. And he will be discussing coastal resiliency and risk exposure with us this morning. So I'm just introducing them both in a row. They will be speaking to you next, and I'll hand it off to Anne. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your attention and for coming today. Um, let me get situated here. You'll be happy to know I don't have any slides, uh, although you will see slides later, and I think they will all be of great value. So first of all, Elizabeth, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you to President Rowe and Dean Douglas, and I think, uh, so I have a number of thank yous here. I'm not sure if Delegate Hodges is here, but we expect him at least at some point if he isn't here already. Um, we're also joined by Deputy Secretary of Finance for the State of Virginia, Joe Flores, who's here. Joe, thank you for driving and, and spending yet another day out of the office. Councilwoman Andrea McClellan is here. Um, Andrea, thank you for, for joining us, as always. Uh, and also, we have some state agency directors, uh, Dr. Jeff Stern, uh, Director of Virginia Department of Emergency, Man Emergency Management is here. Jeff, thank you for coming. And, uh, and thank you for being such a good partner in this effort. Um, we also, I believe, have Louis Lawrence from Middle Peninsula PDC and Dr. Linda Millsaps from the Greater Washington, uh, George Washington Regional Commission here, or at least planning to be here. And I started to introduce city, county, and town managers, and when I got to 10 people, I quit counting. So there are many city, county, and town managers here. Thank you all for, for your attendance. We also have a substantial number of nonprofits here who work in this space, and we have a number of members of the business community. And so at our last uh, Coastal Policy Center clinic, or uh, seminar, or an annual, I guess, uh, event here last fall, uh, someone, I can't remember which speaker, raised, said, you know, raise your hand if you're from the business community. So I'm gonna do that again. Raise your hand if you're from the business community. Thank you very much. Last fall, we had two people, and I think it was the two people sitting over here. So. Um, 
So there's a deliberate intent here as you look around to know, you should know that you are not part of the usual um, environmental resilience suspects. We worked hard to include cities, towns, counties, municipalities, and the business community uh, because this day is for you, as Elizabeth has mentioned, and, and this, um, this information is for you, and this, these wonderful array of speakers we have put together here are for you. Elizabeth, thank you also to you and Angela and to your students for putting this together. And again, thanks to Mike Sapnar who uh, agreed to do this, um, helped put the whole thing together, spent lots of time on the phone with us, and, uh, and also to my colleague and friend David Johnson from Charleston Resilience Network and Hamilton Advisors LLC for his work in helping us put this together. Um, I'm a special assistant to the governor for coastal adaptation and protection here in the state of Virginia. In that capacity, I am designated as the primary point of contact for coordinating the resources to address coastal adaptation and flooding mitigation. It's taken right out of my job description, including, including pursuing federal, state, and local funding opportunities for adaptation initiatives. The most substantial of my tasks is to create a coastal master plan for the state of Virginia that will help us focus as a state our efforts so that we can help planning districts, regional commissions, cities, counties, and towns prepare themselves for the challenges of rising waters. And I often say that the cities, counties, towns, municipalities, and planning districts are ahead of the state. That is true. Uh, and so your input, and some of which many of you have, have already given me input, and I'm still soliciting more, uh, and will continue to do so as we build this plan, this plan will be built around your efforts at this point. And where you have gaps and needs and, and challenges, that's what we would like to address to put together uh, for as a state so that we can focus on those issues to inform the next budget cycle, which will be coming up upon us quite quickly. We're fortunate here in Virginia that we have so many assets of great value along our coastline, but that good fortune also leads to complex adaptation and protection challenges and considerable risk. We have tremendous presence at the federal level, particularly along coastal D Virginia from the Department of Defense in both Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads and in Dahlgren where we have a huge Naval Sea Systems Command Combat Systems Technical Training Center. And we have the NASA pr pr uh, presence at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and Wallops Island Test Facility. Extremely valuable to the nation. All of these assets are extremely valuable to the nation. They are unique. I hope the building's not gonna fall down. Um, <laughs> and. Um, they are indispensable and they are in many cases irreplaceable. So where they are is where they must be to execute their mission. However, that makes Virginia challenged in other ways. We rank first in defense spending as a percentage of our gross domestic product. 8.9% of our GDP is from defense spending. We're also first in defense personnel spending and we're second only behind California in total defense spending and defense contact, contract spending in the state. So we are wedded to our federal partners, whether we like it or not. We're also home to the fourth largest container port by volume in the United States, the Port of Virginia, whose reach extends beyond the Mississippi River, bringing commodities in and shipping out agricultural products and coal. You can love coal or you can hate coal, but we're the number one largest coal exporting point here in Hampton Roads, Virginia, on the east coast of the United States. We also have a substantial tourism industry and unique coastal infrastructure, including one of the only sets of untouched coastal barrier islands in the nation. So a very unique and challenging circumstance, urban, industrial, suburban, rural, all put together in one amazing coastline, 10,000 miles of tidally influenced coastline, all vulnerable, all at risk, and we do still have the highest rate of relative change, now in some places over five millimeters per year, of sea level rise and our nuisance flooding level is between 0.53 and 0.58 meters and we are seeing a trend line where within probably 10 years there will be places where every uh, high tide will reach the nuisance flood level. What does that mean? That means roads, schools, access, critical infrastructure is all vulnerable and that vulnerability is continuing to grow even without the big storm, the big event. So. All this has not gone unnoticed by ratings agencies. Moody's in particular has asked that some cities in coastal Virginia address how they plan to prepare for this risk as a part of their ability to maintain their credit rating. It certainly has gotten their attention. They've also brought this up in conversation at least with Governor Northam and have, they have written reports on the Hampton Roads region's risk in particular and also on the risk to coastal communities writ large. That report came out in 2017. At the state, when I reported aboard in October, I was told 
uh, that Virginia values nothing so much as its AAA bond rating and that I was going to generate big bills. And those two things would be in conflict with each other. And they're both true. Virginia does value its, its AAA rating, and I am, or we are, going to generate big bills. And so how do we come up with solutions to try to address that confluence and help move the state forward to deal with what we know is in our future right now? As I talk to people about what options are in passing to deal with the future, I have a sense that many homeowners feel that the cities are going to bail them out and that the cities feel that the state should bail them out and that the state thinks the federal government is going to bail it out. And in actual, the actuality, none of those things are going to happen. And to get to the point where we're gonna get big federal dollars in here without planning ahead, relying on a storm is pure folly. Um, so how do we plan and ahead and get ourselves prepared? Yes, a storm may come, absolutely, but we can't wait for the storm to take action. We do have a situation also where we see municipalities taking action and begging the state for assistance, guidance, and prioritization. And we have a gubernatorial administration, and I've had several actually, clearly interested in action through Executive Order 24, through the Coastal Protection Act. Um, and yet we see the General Assembly very reluctant to move forward, and in some cases blocking opportunities to move forward. So this is a conundrum. And the reason I find it compelling is this is a nonpartisan issue. This is not something that's limited to impacting some people and not other people. This is not something that we can all argue about whether or not it's happening. The Middle Peninsula is closing schools for the first time ever, it's happened last year, based on sunny day flooding. And Hampton Roads, depending on where you live, and Councilwoman McClellan can give you instance after instance, you have to change the way you go to work, go to school, get around the city of Norfolk based on, it could be flooding today, it just depends on which way the wind's blowing in some areas of the city. Also, tide, rain, storm surge all add to that and contribute to it. So we're dealing with this now. This is a real problem today, and the need to move forward is absolutely urgent. So a year ago, before I got started uh, in this job, Elizabeth and I were talking about how could we help cities and municipalities with something that they were not able to really spend a lot of time on themselves. On themselves. And we looked at the kind of the top five from the pilot planning project I was a part of, setting standards, establishing a consortium of universities, evaluating and, and collecting data, understanding what infrastructure is critical and vulnerable, and that is still a crucial need, by the way, for the state, and Mike will talk about that a little in his remarks. And then lastly, what are our financing strategies gonna be? And we decided that that was the thing where we could add the most value, uh, because it was the thing that people were least likely to be able to spend a lot of time doing research on as they did their day job in their city or county or town. Um, it is not true, it is true that the state has done some work in this regard. We've created a Shoreline Resilience Fund and we haven't funded it. Uh, it's been created since 2016. I believe the administrator is here today, Sean Crumlish, if he's, if, there you are, thanks Sean for coming. Um, if there were to be any money in it, uh, Sean would oversee how that would be administered at least from the financial perspective, but we as a state, without putting any money of this into this, don't really have a great strategy for how we wanna use it. And so what does that mean? It's become all things to all people. It's for grants, it's for loans, it's gonna be what we use with the state as a non-federal sponsor and it's gonna help pay a cost share for Army Corps studies. Really? Well, it can't be all those things. And so we have to decide as a state what we want this to be and how it's gonna add the most value to cities, counties, towns, and municipalities. And we need to decide that now while it has no money in it so that if we get to the point where we can actually get some financing to it, we can begin to implement. And I would add that there have been some very determined efforts on the part of legislators who want to help to try to get a little money in there, but a little money, like $500,000 little money, is not the way to move forward with implementing a bond fund or a revolving loan fund. It's just not enough money to do anything with. So we really need some other strategies for how we get money in there, how we keep money in there, and if you want it to be a grant fund, then there has to be a constant source of income. So what can that be? Food for thought and things we will hear about options to think about today. I have a few questions for people. I'm doing this at the risk of knowing that I'm gonna get a lot of email, but that's fine. Um, how can we gain insight into financial strategies that could become a part of a broader toolkit for cities, counties, and municipalities, and financial managers? How do these, these solutions offer the best value? Are we better doing pooled efforts? Can we do things a city or a county or a region at a time? How do we establish the right set of incentives to get homeowners and cities and municipalities to think about things that are gonna give them the best choices, perhaps? 
And how can the state of Virginia add value to help in creating these funding strategies and processes? So as we move forward, and, uh, and I do have cards, so I'll give you my cards. Um, the other thing we know we will need is legislation. So I'm interested in your thoughts on legislative change that would also be of value. Uh, we will be putting together our next budget cycle starting very soon, as Joe well knows. And uh, a part of the master plan is to identify, again, how we move forward in that context. Here in Virginia, I'll just close with this, our situation is urgent and the needs and costs are going to continue to grow as the range of choices narrows. So the sooner we begin to move forward in earnest and collectively, the better for all of us. I'll close with my favorite quote from Jeffrey, or at least attributed to Jeffrey Chaucer, which is that time and tide wait for no man. Thank you. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I will uh, not thank anybody, since I think everybody's been thanked, although I do want to acknowledge Elizabeth and, and Anne for uh, helping put this together. Uh, it's been uh, a great experience uh, getting to know these people. And, you know, we're, I'm really here because I'm passionate about the issue, not because I have any tremendous uh, expertise. Uh, I'm a CEO of a reinsurance company. Uh, reinsurance is insurance for insurance companies, basically, at the end of the day. And if you think of hurricanes or tornadoes or wildfires or earthquakes or um, boats sinking or I don't want to get into all the bad things that happen, but um, and it's on the front page. That's us. That's a bad day for uh, for a lot of people, but but especially uh, for for us. Um, if I do thank anybody, uh, in particular, I want to thank you for being here. It starts with you. Uh, and you, I, I realized something at dinner last night, we had dinner with some of the speakers, and it was interesting in that uh, it seems to me that a lot of people in this room, uh, especially at the city level, know more than people at the state level and may know more than people at the federal government level. You probably know what your issues are. I'm, I have a very macro view. I'm going to try to uh, br breeze through that and get out of the way for the real experts who are going to talk to you. But this meeting is about bringing together multiple disciplines, public and private, state, local, and federal, ultimately, because we, you know, these are issues for everybody, and it's going to take cross-collaboration. We can't do it together, uh, do it alone. I was talking with Whitney last night. Where's Whitney? She's somewhere here. There she is. She said to me, you know, we're talking about fundraising and everything, and she said, we don't need millions, we need billions. And, you know, that kind of struck me. I know that's true, but we have to start somewhere. Um, and we're interested in the private sector. Yes, we're there for profit, but there's a lot of things that we can do that can enhance our ability to, to properly get a return on our capital that helps the local communities. Uh, we have partnered, for example, we did a million dollar grant to uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I think Peter Haig and uh, Jody Olson are in the room, if they could stand up. So uh, they have programs uh, in, a, in the program that we, you sh if you get a chance, talk to them. We donated a million dollars. They have a $30 million grant from the federal government. They will match a dollar for every dollar the community puts in. They run a competition for, uh, for programs. Uh, that are, uh, They gave out uh, quite a few grants last year. They're hoping to get that funding to $100 million for the uh, upcoming fiscal year. So uh, that's one way that we can uh, start uh, spending some of the money. And hopefully by the end of the day, you add it all up, and it is billions, but we have to start somewhere. So I put this up here because this, we are not here to convince you of climate change. We are not here to convince you of rising uh, uh, seas. Uh, we are, we're really here to try to, uh, to educate. Um, it doesn't matter why the seas are rising, and even if they weren't, we still would have a problem. Uh, by 2020, uh, I think 43% of the population will live in a county that borders a coastline. 43% of the population, and that continues to grow. Um, the, that, with that, obviously, it brings uh, infrastructure and everything else uh, that, that, that's in the way. And why am I passionate about this? I'm passionate for, for personal and professional reasons. I mean, professionally, obviously, um, we, have, we have dollars at risk 
through uh, reinsuring our customers. But personally, I went through Sandy, and I went through it on both a personal and a professional relation, uh, uh, perspective. We had in our building in New York City five million gallons of water in our basement. We were on the ninth floor. We bought insurance, but we didn't buy flood insurance because we were on the ninth floor. I mean, I know, reinsurance company, I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, so we were out of our building because guess where all the mechanical was? It was in the basement, as was most every other building uh, in, in New York. And I had 18 inches of water in my house in Rumson, New Jersey. I'm 30 years in the industry. I opened my insurance policy. I sat down on my desk. I pulled out my policy. I read my policy. I had no idea what kind of coverage I had. I'm 30 years in the business. I can't imagine what it's like when your taxpayers, who were fortunate enough to buy flood cover, would open their policy. So the insurance industry, to a degree, has a problem because we have to build a better product. We only return about 55 cents on the dollar to the consumer. We need to find ways to deliver our product in a more understanding way, in a more responsive way, uh, lower cost of distribution, lower cost of claims handling. And you're going to hear from some people today, especially Evan Glassman, who's here, about how we're trying to do that. And we're not quite there yet, but I think we're close to a, to a tipping point. Um, the other thing I learned, and I think Don Zimmer will talk about this, a former mayor in Hoboken, um, when you have these disasters, what you don't fully appreciate is, yes, you have a disaster at your job, but every one of your employees probably has a personal disaster. And getting your resource to the office to help or to solve problems is going to be a real challenge. And we found that out. We were in the middle of our busiest season, and I had people trying trying to work remotely from home to deal with our customers while they're trying to figure out when their electricity is coming back on, where, the, where they might have to stay that night, how they're going to get heat. So it can be a real, real issue. So my basic five-point plan, or what, we're, what I would suggest, is understand your risk, quantify your risk, mitigate your risk, finance your risk, insure your risk. And you're probably well down the road on, on the first two. And we're not really going to focus a lot on that, on understanding your risk and quantifying your risk. But there are things to think about. We've mentioned credit ratings. That will come up. Uh, just evacuation plans, uh, emergency centers, where are you going to put people up, tax revenues, population loss. I mean, New Orleans is nowhere back to its population post-Katrina. How is that going to affect your community? Quantify your risk. There are models out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about CAP models. I was, uh, this was left to me. I am not a technical person. I grew up doing casualty insurance, not property insurance. But I'll do my best, and I'll probably save you uh, a little bit of boredom because I won't speak long about it. Um, we're going to talk more about mitigating your risk, financing your risk, and, uh, and insuring your risk. Um, I wanted to just also to, to, this is how I think about it a little bit. And again, I probably don't have to convince you, you all of this. But if you read a book called The Black Swan by Nassib Taleb, and his first book was Fooled by Randomness, he talks about how just because you haven't seen a black swan, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But I, when I think about his basic premise, it's about asymmetry. And it's about Take, he talks about how people worry about the frequency of a small positive payoff and ignore the downside of, a, of the big negative event, which is very, very unlikely. The problem is, is when that event might happen, it blows you up and, and you're done. And I think what happens is, is a lot of communities, not necessarily city planners, but mayors and people who have to sell these ideas and pay for these ideas, and that's a big part of how do you educate your community, you wind up picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. The pennies you save today, you're, while you're picking those up in front of the steamroller someday, that steamroller is going to catch you and it's going to flatten you. And we've got to get that message outside of you all and down to the citizens and up to the, to the states and the federal government to figure out how we're going to pay uh, and, and uh, uh, mitigate the risk. All right, some facts and figures, which are always fun. You can write down, prove you were at the conference, say, look what I learned. 
Uh, this shocked me. The, the, the threshold for declaring a federal disaster is only seven and a half million dollars. Uh, I guess that's good. I don't know. Um, maybe that's part of the reason. FEMA is $36 billion in debt. Uh, FEMA uh, had $16 billion of it uh, forgiven by the federal government recently. They take out these loans. They eventually get forgiven. There's talk about um, it going, uh, the 20 billion being, the balance being forgiven, we'll see. Um, they write flood insurance for, for uh, personal uh, homeowners. Again, this is where the insurance industry has failed. In 1962, we left the personal uh, homeowners uh, flood insurance business because we thought we couldn't make money, which we couldn't. It's not actually priced. We could see FEMA is running to 125% loss ratio. So every dollar they take in, they pay out $1.25 in losses. About 30% of the homes they pay claim, I'm sorry, 6% of the homes that they pay claims on account for 30% of their costs annually. So there are a lot of repeat offenders. Only about one in six homes that are actually in floodplains are insured. And then a lot of people who might be in floodplains, like in Houston, where people didn't realize the consequence of you know, basically infrastructure and concrete found their homes flooded when even though they weren't in a quote unquote flood zone. Number four is the biggest reason I'm here. Every dollar spent in mitigation saves $6 in cost ultimately uh, post event should the event happen. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's a big reward. And I think it needs to be um, uh, advertised more. Um, the value of real estate in Miami, a recent study completed in 2016 shows that homes at higher elevations are sold at a 5 to 15% premium to the surrounding homes that are at lower elevations. So there is a quantifiable economic benefit from investing in mitigation uh, to, to the homeowners and then to the towns because that's a higher tax base as well that you can, that you can uh, uh, tax. Um, and then you have uh, recent demand surge shows uh, 20 to 30 percent increase in cost. That is um, studies coming from Irma. Uh, it, the demand surge now Florida is a unique environment because of, of the litigation system down there. But a lot of times uh, communities don't quite get into the uh, implications of of demand surge uh, and what that does to cost. One stat that's not up here, every 1% increase in insurance penetration drives down taxpayer burden post-event by 20%. So if we can get people to buy insurance, that will help drive down the after-event costs. All right. Um, I'm, this doesn't tell you anything you don't already know in terms of um, Norfolk. Obviously, it's vulnerable. Uh, the, the naval base is 100 years old. Uh, when it was built, uh, the sea was a, a one and a half feet lower than it is today. Uh, and parts of the base are subject to uh, nuisance flooding. Um, the Army, uh, US Army Engineer Research and Development Center in 2014 estimated an additional one and a half feet of sea level rise would be the tipping point for, tipping point for serious infrastructure damage to the base and the surrounding uh, area. Uh, one to two times a month, the airfield uh, floods and the fire base, uh, the brick firehouse that is there, um, is surrounded by, by water. In 1960, there were uh, one of these nuisance flood days a year. Now they're, um, now they're eight times that, that number. Uh, obviously, this is critical to national defense, and this is a, an asset that the community should use to uh, Lean on the federal government as much as you can because they as, as, have as much as interest as, as you do. Well, maybe not as much, but they have a lot of interest. So hurricanes are common to the region. Uh, since 1870, 63 storms. That split is 39 tropical storms and 24 cate uh, category one storms have uh, caused damage in the area. Uh, in any one year, there's a 42% probability of being uh, affected. Um, and I'm trying, I have somewhere the uh, split on that. Um, some of that is a direct hit. I don't, I, I don't know what percentage is direct and what is tangential that comes up from, a, from another uh, coastal area. 
uh, a major cat. So you see the three, the four category four storms, and uh, the population at risk and the and the flooding inundation as the category storms go across to a to a level uh, form four. There only a cat one has made a direct hit in the area historically. Um, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. I mean, the way Sandy came in, kind of curling back around, we really don't have any uh, really good science as to storm path, and they are quite unpredictable. A category one in the area would produce, by our model estimates, $1 billion of damage. A category two would produce $9 billion of damage, and a category three would produce $37 billion of insurable damage. Now. These numbers are wind and, and uh, storm surge only. Do, they do not include damage to public infrastructure, offshore properties, marine cra uh, craft, or sewer backup. Um, only about one third of economic damages uh, are insured. So if you do the math, that means a, a category three, 37 billion of insured damages means economic damages to the region in the area of $125 billion. $125 billion, category three. Not inconceivable by any stretch, my opinion. So I'll give you a quick history on uh, models. Uh, this is where uh, I, will, I will be brief. I tried to put some animation in to make it more interesting. So hurricane models started really post um, Yugo in 1989, David probably remembers Yugo, uh, which was a direct hit in uh, South Carolina. Uh, and then in 1992, Hurricane Andrew happened and there were 11 insurance company insolvencies and people started to take a lot more note on catastrophe models. Then we started to uh, get into storm surge around these models, so not just wind damages. Uh, and by the way, wind damage, just so you know, it's exponential. This is not a linear thing. One, per, one mile an hour more cause exponentially more damage, not just a percentage more damage. So as, as you move up the scale, it becomes that much more catastrophic. Her, uh, Katrina, now Katrina, Rita, and Wilma all happened in the, in the same year. Uh, Katrina was about $40 billion of damages back then, probably about $65 billion today. One thing we learned about Katrina from a modeling standpoint is we took into account the levees that were built around the country to hold back water, uh, and so it was assumed those levees would hold up. They did not hold up in Katrina, uh, and I think that is probably uh, likely category three and above around the country, so models have taken into account of that. Um, we're trying to get more granular hazard data, um, and modeling is getting better. The biggest problem with modeling really is flood. Um, elevations are very difficult to get. Resolution is very difficult, uh, and I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, sometimes there seems no rhyme or reason why one house has three feet of water in it and the house next door is dry. The, the purpose of the models is to estimate the probability of loss and physical damage to property, time element, but they're not perfect. Uh, they're just there to give us a directional um, view. Uh, they do, they are getting better as data gets better and as uh, data is crucial to it, just uh, getting the inputs to get m uh, more accurate outputs, obviously. But they are being used increasingly now in insurance products through parametric triggers, which we'll talk about. Um, and the technology there is starting to, to uh, really take off. Um, they don't really get into future climate change right now. It doesn't get into cleanup, uh, which is a lot of costs that you will have. Um, doesn't talk about the cost of adjusting the losses. Um, and it doesn't really account for uh, the new phenomena or a new ish, it seems, where these storms just sit and dump a bunch of water on, a, on an area. Um, this, again, is, is fairly uh, something you don't you've probably looked at before. The, the pink area is, the, is three of the main piers. Uh, sorry, the pink area is the airfield and the purple area is three of the uh, um, main piers. And it shows um, really what the flood depths under the one year uh, return period would be to show you how the water would come in and, and, um, 
and flood everything, which was kind of cool, trying to keep it interesting. So, um, the, in summary, you know, what I really want you to, to take away here is that know your risk, uh, have an articulated plan because you never know when you're going to need it and when you're going to have an opportunity to grab funding. And I think what you'll hear today is uh, you don't know when the opportunity strikes, but obviously if you're prepared, you're in a much better position. You're going to get that money first. People are not going to wait around uh, while you develop your plan after the event. Um, so when your resources are, str are stressed, so are your people. That's something you need to think about. When your costs are stressed, so is your revenue. You've got businesses that aren't open. You've got taxpayers leaving town. Uh, you've got cleanup costs. You need cash immediately. Uh, we need to do better as a community on public-private partnerships. That's why I'm here today. Um, you don't need a storm to monet monetize mitigation benefits. We'll talk about uh, credit risk, and I, I talked to you about property values. And, uh, you know, the words that, that come together for me are just education, vision, collaboration, have conviction, and be prepared. I thank you for your attention. Turn it over to um, Elizabeth. Thank you.